Now you have it on speaker view, right? Otherwise it will come out like this on. I, I don't have it on speaker view. I have it on, just a minute. What do I have it on? I have it on, what's that called when there are all these little pictures? Gallery view. Gallery view. So where is speaker view, Ken? I hear you. Go ahead, Maria, it's time. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with David Cope, and I would like to find him if I could. David, where are you, honey? I'm right here. Yeah, well, not in my... Oh, I see you. I see you. Okay, good. Well, David, okay. All right, David, read your poem, please. Okay, uh, we'll David do. Cope is from Grenville, Michigan. Okay. Uh, flight to Palmonic, a still station. JFK, full stop. 50 mile an hour winds, gusting even higher over New York, swirling. We deplane at Detroit, city of my birth. Airline agent beleaguered and bullied, irate passengers wanting answers now. Arms gesticulating, faces contorted. Others phone those they love, lament missed connections or watch the slow rolling clouds, bright light and horizon with its promise. A still station now. Fellow passengers share tales as I outline Walt's endlessly rocking cradle. The birds lament that gave him his calling. Life of singing words as comfort in this sea of sorrow. Even as I too am headed for his pulmonic, where I'll share hours with old friends and make new ones. I'll sing my poems, recitative in East Setauket and Garden City. Visit Whitman birthplace and wonder how the Walt Whitman Mall across the street might sit with him in these latter days when the heart itself is a commodity. I hear the morning bird in the swamp, even as the agent announces we'll take off in an hour. Ah, generous spirit of singing words abiding still. Thank you. I love it, David. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, next is Jack Foley uh, from Oak, Oakland, California. I'm glad to see Jack again. And I know I saw him a minute ago, so I can't find him now. Um, I should be there. Oh, here you are. Here you are. I see you. Okay. Okay, Jack. Go ahead. Read your poem. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Ballade of Neglected Poets. After Francois Villon, Ballade des Dames de ballad of women of former times. Jack Foley, where is he in all these histories? Ivan Arguez, what rung does he occupy on the ladder of poetic accomplishment? Jake Berry, musician and visual artist as well as poet, where is he? Richard Silber, Joyce Jenkins, Ted Jones, M.L. Liebler, Mackie Starfield, mais où sont les neiges d'antan? What about John Oliver Simon, Harold Norse, Mary Marsha Casoli, Clara Sue? Where are they in the great historical march of literary events? Paul Mariah, remember him? Yes. Francisco at Alacon, who always asked, which way is north? I threatened to buy him a compass. Catherine <laughs> Hastings, David Meltzer, David Melnick, David Mason, Donald Schenker, Ed Foster. Maria Mazziati Gillen, Andrew <laughs> Doran, Philomene Long, John Thomas, Carlotta Caulfield, Edward Mikeu, Ronald Johnson, Nanos Valoritis, Daniel Philip Brady, Ron Silliman, Jose Garcia Villa, Les Ousson Les Neiges d'Anton, James Broughton, Big Joy, Lou Harrison, famed as a composer, but a poet as well. Judy Grawn, James Denbor, Fanny Howe, Susan Howe, Kenneth Rexroth, Louis Turco, Neely Tcherkowski, Kuhn Woon, Dana Joya, Vince Storty, Nina Serrano, Gregory Vincent St. Thomasino, Lucille Langday, Raymond Nat Turner, Bob Kaufman, Ishmael Reed, Stephen Cole, Halpna Singh Chitness, Hal Young, 
Ulchar E. Linzan, Jenny Lim, Christian Panzica, Ray Miller, Hank Lazar, H. D. Moe, Mary Rudge, Lawrence Joe Leigner, Larry, more Black Mountain than language, Toby Lurie and Synesthesia, Tom Clark, Kathy Dana, Jerome Rothenberg, Clive Matson, Robert Duncan, Jess, Lola Haskins, Jennifer Reeser, Robert Sward, all the language poets, all the new formalists, all the jazz poets, and the beat poets, and the ethnic poets, they come and speak and are awarded prizes, and then vanish like the wind. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? The snows come and go and suffer the effects of global warming. The newspapers are full of the rhetoric of a mad president. Film stars, actors in television series, performers on YouTube, popular singers. But where are the poets in all this? Catholics, atheists, Jews, Buddhists, Protestants, non-affiliated, Muslims, knee-jerk journalists, philosophers, mad, rational, male, female, LGBTQ, <laughs> self-destructive, in good health, all. Which of us remembers Sarah Teasdale? Which of us remembers Eleanor Wiley? Julia Vinograd and Lynn Livshin have recently died. And does anyone at all remember George Henry Boker? What of Katie Kariaka Nakamura and John L. Stanisi? Où sont les neiges? Où sont les poètes d'antan? Thank you. Very good, Jack. And you have been keeping poets, poetry alive through your radio uh, series for years and years. Thanks, Jack. Um, Thank Ted, Ted Johannesson, North Bergen, New Jersey. Ted? Here or not? Not. Diane Corey from Crestville, New Jersey. Diane, I, I saw you before. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. How to pass along a tradition. First, you start with a great grandfather, planting, watering, nurturing a grapevine in a backyard in Brooklyn, a vine that offers grapes and leaves for decades. Then you have a risk-taking father who moves his young family to New Jersey, the country as Brooklynites call it, and a mother who holds on to precious traditions. This young man plants shoots from the old man's vine in the New Jersey soil, builds a trellis to guide their growth, and the leaves appear, tender leaves to be picked, a hundred or more each time by the young man's wife. She learned well what her mother taught her, about keeping traditions, make sure she teaches her children too. And I, one of those children, learned well, all my mother taught me about traditions, that you must learn as a child how to pick leaves tender without tough veins, how to stack them and wash and prepare them, how to feel the right texture of meat and rice with your fingers as you mix and season, how to handle gently each ready leaf how to fold it tight over the mound of meat so it doesn't unroll while cooking. You then have to take shoots from the grapevine in the backyard where you played as a child, plant and nurture them in your own yard when you have a home of your own. And you have to make time to carry on the traditions of generations, to remember those living yet in your soul and to smile with them as you work at your own kitchen table, knowing they are with you keeping you company, helping you at your task. Thank you. Very good, Diane. Thank you very much. Um, Linda Lerner from Brooklyn, New York. And I know I saw you before, Linda. Okay, I'm here. I also recorded it because I'm having voice problems. So let me just see. Okay. Find the source. A friend says of ants that just appeared in my kitchen like live bits of worry. 
Unable to, I place traps everywhere. This week, Easter and Passover merged. People send, have a happy to whichever I ignore. Nothing about Passover I don't observe, but doesn't feel quite right to say, like saying I didn't love my father. Unable to trace back to exactly when I knew he didn't love me. The ants, one step ahead of me, are now crawling on my desk, over my computer, across a photo of a family seated at a Seder, fast uploading those I sat through as a child. My divorced uncle, a perennial, looking bored as my brother asked why and why again. Nothing about why we need bitter herbs to remind us of ancient difficulties. Plenty now, I think, trying to block what finds new ways to get in. My friend writes, the ants eat the bait, go back, and feed it to the queen, and they both die. Comes through old hurts, regrets, my brothers, why is this night different from all other nights? And, the and it's a reference to the four questions asked during the Seder. And the date for this was April 19th to April 28th, uh, 2019. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, next is Mark Levy from Sam Samuel Salem, Massachusetts. Is Mark here? Okay, if he's not here, then ML Liebler from St. Clair Shores, uh, Michigan. ML, where are you, darling? I'm right here. Color Polaroid. I am holding in my hand a faded color Polaroid of my grandmother and grandfather. They are standing close to each uh, other in the hallway that I've walked down 1,000 times. I remember the eggshell painted trim my grandpa used to make it easier for grandma to clean, and I can see that it is still clean and unblemished. My grandmother is looking up, smiling at my grandfather, who too is smiling into the camera's lens. I can sense their deep love for each other. I know they have always had that for one another, standing in the arch in the long hallway. I'm sure that love still exists in the house where we all lived long ago. I reach out now to touch them both again. My fingers softly touch my grandmother's arm in the photo. I want to know them both again in the way I did back then. On occasion, I ride my bicycle through the old neighborhood past our old house. And if the sun catches my bedroom window pane just at the right angle in time, I'd swear I can see her looking out from behind the lacy curtains. I long for those days as a young boy when my only care was getting home before the street light and front turned magically on, lighting my way back home. That is where I first knew the deep love I had for these two souls hugging and smiling in a faded old photo in the hallway of our old house. Oh, I love it, ML. Thank Wonderful. Um, Okay, let's see, wait a minute. Alice Mars from Lewis, Delaware. Alice Mars, I think I'm here, that's cool. yes. Yes. Um, when the man is away, the wife can return to herself. And when she returns, our mom sits in the man's recliner, pulls back the lever and relaxes. And we kids come out of hiding, ask if she'll read to us or sometimes she offers. My brothers and I lounge on the living room floor as page by page our mom takes us rafting down the river or galloping away on mighty stallions. And sometimes we go to places of deep sorrow where we cry. And when she bakes her bread on Tuesdays, magic. A bit of yeast, sugar, warm water, 15 pounds of Robin Hood flour, mixed, kneaded, punched down, placed into greased tins, turned out loaf after loaf steaming on every countertop. Our mom, the contented baker, 
like in the childhood picture where she wears a long white apron, puffy white hat, wooden spoon in hand, the biggest smile, the girl who does not know her future. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Denise Calvetti Michaels from Kirkland, Washington. Is she with us? I feel sorry for some of these people because sometimes I forget I'm supposed yeah. to be on. So I'm quite forgiving of this. Yeah. Donna. No, I'm here. Um, Maria, I am here. I'm sorry. Did you, are you waiting for me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Are you. I'm, I, when I look, I, I'm right next to you, but I don't know what it looks like. Yeah, for I, you. See you. I see you. Okay. Yeah. Um, good morning. And, and thank you for everything you do to keep the door open for poets. Thank you. Thank you. Love letter number two, dear daughter. I remember Sunday road trips before seatbelts to Monterey after church. I sat in the back next to Nona Agostina, Italian-American great-grandmother you met only once when you were three. We were driving to the ocean, leaving behind Salinas, Prim, Moreau, lettuce, and strawberry, black earth valley in shadows of the Gabalans. Hairpin curves as we pass Laguna Seca racetrack. How old am I? Not sure. Maybe James Dean is alive, not yet driving his Porsche Spider to the car rally September 55. I barely see out the Chevy window. White-tailed deer bolt. Dad slams the brake. Stray dog we confuse with coyote. And dad laughs, live and let live. I still hear coyote howling in the ravine back of our house when I'm alone reading. And when you were a little girl, wakened with an earache, I sat with you, filling a warm water bottle to divert you from the pain to the sound of the owl in the cherry tree above the window. Nona never forgot to make the sign of the cross as we pass by the site of a wooden crucifix. Maybe I was barely four, observing Nona whisper prayers in dialect, absorbing dispositions for remembering. My father explained each cross marked a resting place. Uncle Frank called the crosses descansos. Perhaps I did not hear any words at all. There are precious monuments you may pass by and not understand. They are talismans from the heart picked clean. Thank you. Wonderful, Denise. Thank you so much. Um, Donna Macaron, I hope I'm pronouncing your late yes, name. Yeah, you are pronouncing it correctly, more than <laughs> anyone has. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Donna? At the rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike. In the back of the station wagon, we kids are rolled in old quilts, pretending to be mummies, waiting for our lives to begin. In the front seat are parents, wedged between them the baby and thermoses of coffee. Lids on tight, we set off into the night. At the gas station, we tumble out onto grease-slicked asphalt where we whine and beg for sweets to fill cravings we cannot name. Back on the highway, my sister and I curl into each other. I am the spoon, she the lick of jam. We share our bag of licorice and giddy expectation. Her hair smells like Play-Doh. It's a mile before someone notices the empty space we left, Stephen, at the Molly Pitcher rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike. My father swerves, the old rambler jumps the curb. Someone cries out, whoa, as we dash back down the road. Laughing, we find the boy we'd nearly lost. How could we know? How could we know the future when he would slip away again and we would not get him back? Thank you. Wonderful, honey. Loved it. Uh, Elizabeth Marchetti, Totowa, New Jersey. 
Elizabeth, I know I saw you before. I did see you, didn't I? Yes, I know I did. Okay, Elizabeth Marchetti, I lost you. Where'd she go? She's not here, Maria. Well, she was here before. Yeah, but not anymore. <laughs> she like me. She needs the bathroom. Okay, um, I'll call. I'll call her again. Uh, Greg Moga, is Greg here from Huntington, New York? Greg Moga. Okay, uh, Jennifer Markelli. I, I saw her. Yeah, you're here, right? I saw you, you a minute ago, but now I can't find I you. I am here. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Maria. Pearls. In the end, those months just before the final purple twilight, my mother would look around the nursing home realizing what was happening. She didn't realize Joni and I were already cleaning out the house. In the other bedroom, we found Liz's cans of Aquanet long sprayed out a Louis Vuitton clutch, a real one. We found a fake strand of pearls too fat and light to be made of real spit. They lay coiled in a black velvet case that snapped shut on the skin between my thumb and pointer. Do you want these? Would you wear them? No one wore pearls anymore. My mother would cry so loud and hard, the nurse, afraid she'd upset the other women on the floor, let her sit at the front desk, shuffle through old time magazines, receipts, as if she worked there with tasks to complete. Thank you. Wonderful, Jennifer. You caught something very important. Um, Okay, wait a minute. I got Marianne Meyer from Sharon, Massachusetts, or Mayor. I'm not really sure. Mayor, Mary Ann Mayer from Sharon, Massachusetts. Are you here? Yes or no? Going once, going twice, gone. Uh, Richard Modiano, uh, Mar Visa, California. Richard, there or not? No. Sheila Massoni, Hackensack, no, okay. Steve Myers, I know I saw you. Right Steve here. Myers from uh, <laughs> Central Valley, Pennsylvania. Hi, Steve. Hi, Hi. thanks, Maria. Thanks for putting together this uh, wonderful event. Really wonderful to hear all these folks. The poem's called At the Boat Sheds Herculaneum. It's for Harry Humes, wonderful poet, and a, uh, his father was an anthracite miner up in the coal regions in Pennsylvania. At the boat sheds, Herculaneum. Heads tipped back like supplicants to receive the purple wine from a silver chalice. Their eyes would have lifted to the mountain, then down again to a sea of diamonds inlaid chips of marble set in the floor by slaves. To capture the moon's white shimmer, to illuminate the room, skeletal knuckle bones the thought blazed in, down at the stone boat sheds, marking the edge of what had been the literal, where 400 perished from the shock wave of crematory heat fleeing to the sea. Easy for the eye to comprehend from the dugout town, the six stories of ash that interred them, its obliterating mass, and drawing closer and still closer to the jumble of uncovered bone and skull. How could I not remember the Avondale miners, the 239 at Dar Mine, the mammoth, the mather, explosion, fire, roof fall, 
inundation. Their cracked white cups of hot black tea, potato soup, a heel of bread hacked off for lunch, their wives, children, generations bartering breath for scrip and burial under mountains, their shades, black plaster casts in vast fields of black diamond. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Baruch November, November, is Baruch here? Baruch November, New York, New York, no? Okay, Kathy Nelson, Fairview, North Carolina. Kathy here or not? Okay. Um, I saw Lisa, Lisa Cole, Nicolau, you're here, aren't you, darling? Okay. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Lisa's Hello. Fairlawn. Hello, everybody. So happy to be here. This is a lifetime in five minutes. My grandmother always said yes. So grateful for the chance to escape the confines of her narrow life. Just let me get my purse. Yes to the car wash, thrilled to watch the beads of water hold magically upward. Yes to getting into a rowboat at 80, joking that next she would try marijuana and laughing so hard that the boat almost tipped. Just give me five minutes when any of us called and asked for a meal or a cafe con leche. And like a little miracle, she would present her food to us, an omelet her offering, or fluffy white rice with a mound of beans. After my grandfather died, she took her first vacation and wore her first pair of pants on the plane. I wonder how my grandmother endured her load without complaint, remembering the strands of her stories that at 10, her cousin Carmen kicked a nest of wasps and my grandmother covered her cousin's body, saving Carmen's sweet skin, but almost losing her own. The priest came to give last rites. At 17, she arrived at the New York Harbor along with the Spanish flu. She got deathly ill, received another visit from a priest, escaped death's grip again, my grandmother spent the rest of her days caring for others, suffering the, wraths of her, the wrath of her in-laws, wheezing from asthma, but still giving her love to all of us, especially to me, the youngest of the lot. The other morning, as I left the doctor, all I wanted was to call my grandmother and ask her to make me some breakfast. Just give me five minutes, she would tell me. Her kindness is my inheritance. Thank you. Wonderful. I love that poem, Lisa. Thank you. Um, next is Yahshua November from Teaneck, but I believe he's re he has a religious prohibition against any, any doing anything on a Saturday, so I don't think that can be right. Um, Suzanne O'Connell from Los Angeles, California. No? Okay. Uh, Elaine Piper from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right. Um, Jason Pool, Jason Craig Pool from Bentham, Pennsylvania. And I saw you, Jason. I'm here. So I know you're there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. This is called Stars. In New York City, we never saw the stars at night. Well, that's not exactly true. Outside the Ziegfeld Theater, we saw the stars from the latest Hollywood films as they strolled in and out of the theater on the red stretch of carpet, stars that were protected by the velvet ropes and the photographer's flashes. Or on a side street in Times Square, if we passed the stage door at just the right time, we'd spot one of Broadway's leading players dash to the black car with tinted windows that waited to whisk them away after the last curtain fell. Or sometimes at a lanes after midnight, we caught glimpses of New York's hometown celebs as they dined on pasta and veal, dripped sauce and sipped wine and blended in with the late night dining crowd. Those were the stars we saw. But the lights of the city, 
the constant glaring glow of the millions of light bulbs from Times Square's spectaculars and the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building and the World Trade Center, the lights of the taxi cabs and the buses and the cars that flowed like electric blood in the arteries and capillaries of New York City streets, the lights from the apartment buildings, white squares turning on and off like silhouettes of, against the silhouettes of flat black towers, all those lights distorted reality, made it seem like midday at midnight. They've lowered the night skies, you said, and they took the stars from the heavens. That's what you used to say. But there were nights when we left the city to taste the dark quiet of the country, and we unplugged ourselves from the bright and constant electric hum. I remember standing in the field with you, away from all the trees where nothing blocked the endless skies, how it felt like I was falling down, or maybe it was falling up, even though the soles of my sneakers flattened the damp blades of grass beneath my feet. I remember how the silence was broken by the sound of air being sucked into my lungs, an unconscious, <laughs> unplanned gasp. Has it always been like this? My voice, strange and alien even to myself, as if we were witnessing the very beginnings of the universe. The, bri the brilliant shining planets. You told me they were planets. The flickering of far off airplanes or orbiting satellites or streaking comets. Is this always happening every night? I imagine feeling so small would be terrifying. I thought we'd feel insignificant when we looked up and saw millions of sparkles illuminating the deep space above our heads. But it was one of the first times I ever felt so connected, a part of something much bigger than me, perfect in design, part of the history of all time, or even before that, the first swirlings and gatherings of cosmic dust, the first inklings, first ideas of a universe reflected in the lights in the sky. I want to remember this, I said. Help me to remember. Don't let me forget when we get home. You put your arm around my shoulder and we watched. Thanks. Wonderful, Jason. Um, Next is Marion Paganello from Fairlawn, New Jersey. Marion, I know I saw you before. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hi, thank you. It's a gift to be here. Okay. Monumental. I want a wall built of the purest granite, a very long and very tall wall to sparkle in the light of the sun the way the once white stele at Stonehenge did. On it, I want every name carved of every man, woman, child, and baby who died from AIDS, to speak of them and acknowledge that a generation of unwritten poems, plays, books, essays, articles, and letters, unfinished diaries, unsung songs, unuttered vows, and unformed families died with them. Miles of blank canvas, gallons of unstirred paint, reams of unspooled paper, pounds of unmolded clay, yards of uncut garments, unmeasured steps, fallow drawing boards and corporate boards, all unformed, all unknowable. Against this monumental silence, I want a monument to this monumental waste. I want to find my brother's name, Griswold, Delacroix, Namek, etched on it. I want to press my fingertips hard into those edges so that they come away with his imprint. And I want to press my cheek against this wall and whisper all the things that I carry for him to him. A massive wall, sacred, and in the very fact of it, tragic and profane, a tribute to all the fallen and unrealized lives all the casualties in an undeclared war of government neglect, a tribute to all the warriors and foot soldiers who organized, pushed back, raised their voices in a long howl of outrage until they were heard. Let us build this wall, making a place for us to come, to announce all their unrealized possibility, to commune with them and with one another, to declare our hearts granite veined with grief, and let memory make them porous again. While there is no way to retrieve these lost lives 
or even settle such a score. Documenting their names fixes them in history and allows them to speak. Wonderful, Marion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Penny, I see you. Penny Perry from Rainbow, California. I saw you one second ago. Oh, here she is. Hello, Maria. Hello. Hi. And Bill is here Hi, too. Bill. Hi. <laughs> can, can Bill read first? We missed him. No, that's okay. Oh, we missed him? Okay. Uh, I don't know. He wasn't. Okay. I didn't think I called his name, but maybe I. No, he can read. Oh, first. oh okay. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Penny. I'll read first. <laughs> okay. You'll get two for one. Okay, sweetheart. Good. Okay. I love you, Maria. I okay. love you too, honey. Um, I know. <laughs> Fig bars. My husband, daughter, and I sit on the bed. Outside, smoke and ash. On TV, families south of here pack vans with photos and pets. Two years ago, our daughter tried to kill herself. Today is her birthday. She writes cat carrier, dog leash. While we still have electricity, my husband bakes fig bars, our daughter's favorite, from fruit he pipped two Septembers ago, then frozen and all but forgot. Our old wood ranch house on the edge of a ravine, a welcome mat for fire, smells of cinnamon. Back in the bedroom, the three of us huddle, chew sticky fig bars, ink in letters in the crosswords, as if this were a normal Sunday. As birds leave our valley, smoke is bringing an early dusk. We switch TV channels from the Woody Allen movie to the news. The fire now 20 miles away. The threat we accepted when we moved here a quarter century ago before our daughter was born. The danger is normal, we tell her, happy to reassure. She adds old photos to her list. My husband and I share a smile. We will watch the skies all night in case the wind shifts. Wonderful, Penny. And then Bill Harding. Hi, Maria. Hi, sweetie. This is a terrific, this is a terrific issue you put out. Congratulations. Thank you. And dear. Uh, on the chance that uh, Laura Boss is uh, watching, uh, I wanted her to know that uh, she's in our thoughts with love. This is called Steps Going Sideways. By the river, one tomb to the other, it's barely 500 feet, the entire run with the current, speeding up on its way to the Great Falls less than a mile north. By foot, all uphill from the riverbank, it's a thousand feet, plus those careful steps from curbs to grave sites, a trip I've never had the courage to take alone, from one set of grandparents to another. Each cemetery claims its own religion and has its own bridge, connecting to the riverside neighborhood of my first smile. I would come to know every sidewalk crack on the five minute walk up 7th Avenue, from my grandmother's kitchen to our upstairs over my uncle the doctor's office. I could get almost there, to the curve facing the giant elms on the lawn, near enough to the Knights of Columbus to hear my grandfather arguing on the bocce court, but East 18th Street was too busy with traffic for a seven-year-old to cross by himself. Patsy's Tavern was off limits too, unless I was sent to see if Tony Ice could take time from his free beer and pizza slice for a quick delivery. Same rule for Joe the Barber to fetch an uncle and high grades for forgotten groceries. On my side of East 18th Street, I could walk up to the tiny library on Madison Avenue, down to PS 21 with my sister and into grasshopper filled lots on the way. A continent separates me from that river, 
those graves, that grid of streets, able to go anywhere now, I go nowhere. On sunny mornings by the pool, a breeze sometimes carries the echo of small feet on pavement and the smell of the Passaic in spring, hard and sour, like mustard, carrying it down to the ravine where a family of live oaks leans close, crowns touching, sheltering virgin soil, claiming this ground as their own. Oh, I love it, Bill. Not, be not only because it's my own neighborhood, but because you really recreated it. <laughs> you brought it back to me really Thank very you. clearly. Um, okay, let me see. I, I lost my... Okay, next is Simon Perchik, East Hampton, New York. I don't know if he's here. Simon Perchik. Okay, and now Ruben, I saw you. And now Ruben, unless you've disappeared, I did see you before. And now... I'm here. Um, Where are you, darling? I I'm up here. <laughs> Let's see. Um, am I supposed to do something? Yeah, she's supposed to read your poem. So right, don't but how do I make that. myself go in the middle? I, I just can't know. find you, but... In my picture, I'm up on the far left, but I don't know. Do I, I, don't I, do I put something else, like choose virtual background, or I just leave it? I found you. I found you. You found me. Oh, okay. Am I ready? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. December in the Rose Garden. This was written in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. The roses are closing for winter, light, late buds frozen. The bush called quietness has lost its leaves. Is it only the human that grieves? I once saw a mare galloping madly back and forth from fence to fence as her friend was lowered into a hole in the earth. Agnes and Alice, Christine and Silver Moon are bare, not a leaf nor bloom remains. I think I will not grieve again after so many I've lost, I've loved have left like something scraped for myself. Maybe I'm finally learning to savor the flow like the stream bed smoothed by what it can't hold. Winter reminds me nothing stays put. On this cold, bright day, the sky of perfect blue, bare stark trees lined up like weathered humans are gesturing with their whole beings, holding the gestures, stances frozen like children play in statue how we think it would be if time stopped now, if time were anything at all. The wife of Bath and little Nell look dead. Gypsy queens, pale pink blossoms, looked like they could last forever, but her leaves had finished falling. Oh, wonderful, and then. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Charlie Rossiter, Bennington, Vermont. Formerly of Oak Yo. Park, Illinois. Hi, you Charlie. Hi there. <laughs> Here we go. One chilly August morning, something happened. This morning, I have a vague recollection of loons crying out across the lake in front of Mimi's Minnesota cottage. Was that the August on our way to Manitoba, when it was so cold we'd lit the wood stove and let the bacon slow cook while we played a whole game of Scrabble. I never knew you could let bacon go so long on low like that. The aroma filled the cabin. I forget who won, but I recall the loons. And if it wasn't that August, I'll say it was anyway. It all <laughs> happened sometime. The loons, the wood stove, Scrabble, Mimi, bacon, the lake. The memory is too warm and real to let a few details Get in the way. I love it, Charlie. Beautiful. Um, now, I don't know whether Danny Romero from Sac Sacramento, California is here. Danny? Perhaps not. Deborah Real of Mamawa, New Jersey. I think I That's saw me. you. Yep. 
That's oh, me. I know it for you. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is uh, written about my father-in-law, Tony. He dedicated his life to aluminum, 12 hours a day, six days a week, carrying heavy armloads from warehouse to plant, plodding through a dimly lit airless tunnel in a procession of men too breathless to speak. In one direction, replenishing the assembly line, then returning the scrap just as grueling to be recycled and carried back again. Too exhausted at night to be much of a father, husband, yet knowing he was fulfilling his duty to keep his loved ones fed and housed. Vacation was generous thanks to the union, but he had to take it all at once. Six weeks of joy with his family, time to reunite with his cherished wife, to teach his boys to love the violin that he, at 13, played in Carnegie Hall. When his time off was finished, he returned to the plant, anticipating tortured muscles, but glad to be back. Then he heard, weren't you told? Didn't you get a letter? The plant's been automated, a conveyor belt installed, much more efficient. You don't work here anymore. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Hi. Uh, the next person is Kenneth Ronkowitz from Sear Grove, New Jersey. Ken, did I see you? Of course, I'm here. Okay, darling. Okay, go. This is the language of ancestry. It was only recently that I visited Slovakia, a country from which I have ancestors. I did not get to my grandparents' village far north near the mountains bridging Poland, but just being there, I, there felt, I felt at home, which may be from my genes or my imagination. As a child, I was told my father's family was Czech. My mother's family was German. When I was older, I wanted to know more about our family history. I found my father's parents' marriage certificate, which said they were born and married in Austria, Hungary. I asked them for clarification. We spoke Slovak, said my grandmother. So we were Czechoslovakian. But it says here, I began to reply, but I could see there was no point in arguing. I asked my mother about where her family came from in Germany. And when I found the town on the map, it is in Austria. But we spoke German, she said. And so we were German. In the language of ancestry, I am Slovak and German, but on paper, I am Austrian. On a map now, Czechoslovakia does not exist. Split into two with many miles between. But my grandparents' village is still at the top of Slovakia and my mother's ancestor's village is still in Austria. Like my father, the youngest child, I speak no Slovak. No German learned from my mother who was once fluent. Other than some foods and some holiday traditions, those old countries are lost to me. Even my name is someone else's name. Misspelled at Ellis Island, my grandfather, assumed that they made you American that way. Ronskevitz became Ronkowitz, as they had changed his Yosef to Joseph. This language is unwritten, carried over time unconsciously, spoken only to our children. Mm. Wonderful, Ken. Thank you. Uh, Lee Rossi from San Carlos, California. Lee, I see you. Hi, Maria. Thank you. Hi, dear. All right. My poem um, is called The International House of Insomnia. <laughs> it was the last can of paper straws in the Western United States, and William the Conquered had already used and discarded half of them, a process that had taken barely a month of malts, shakes, and Diet Cokes, not to mention smoothies, slushies, and homemade Slurpees. When it became clear that not even the internet was going to save him, 
that the whole rest of the world, India included, had switched to those perfectly extruded green and red plastic tubes they gave away at McDonald's and 7-Eleven, he began rinsing and reusing them. Rinsing didn't completely eliminate the taste of his previous meal. Cherry and chocolate left the most residue or at least the most taste, but it did help. It meant that the next liquid had to be thicker and stronger tasting than the last, and that only, and that only hastened the straw's demise. But for the moment, he could only eat or drink <clears throat> with a straw. And for whatever reason, it had to be a paper straw, the kind with a thin helical join, often colored, starting at one end and spiraling to the other, thereby providing strength and visual interest. That was one thing that bothered him about contemporary straws. Despite their intense neon colors, they were all the same, the same green or red or sparkle pattern, the same smooth and violable texture, a rifle barrel without the rifling. He noted that there was probably something wrong with him, in addition to all the conditions known to his, um, his doctor and psychiatrist, something that paper straws could only salve but not cure. But he was running out of straws and very soon he was going to have a very big problem. Of course, he realized that people in Chekhov didn't have these problems. He was always reading Chekhov's stories and always reading himself into Chekhov's characters. It was easier than being himself. But their problems didn't encompass the disappearance of a basic tool of domestic life. Or if they did, they did so in a way which escaped his limited understanding of 19th century Russian life and technology. Besides, he'd never met a Ch Chekhov character who suffered from his peculiar dental pathology. His teeth had the disturbing habit of cracking and splitting whenever he bit down on something harder than a jelly bean. Maybe it came from all those years cracking unpopped kernels of popcorn. Now, whenever he chewed burnt toast, a sliver of enamel would calve from his tooth like an Antarctic iceberg. But maybe that was only his presenting symptom. Maybe there was more to his condition than he suspected. Thank you. Wonderfully. Thank you. Uh, Patricia McKiernan Brunkel, Short Hills, New Jersey. I know I saw you. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Yes. All right. Hi, Maria. Hi, everybody. Hi, dear. My poem is called Tributaries, um, as in streams that flow into a larger body. Right. Tributaries. Babies puzzle over things like this. How trees flow backward in the window of a car. How one mother leaves and another returns. I used to watch my daughters disappear. My mind knew they existed, but my eye was unconvinced. The school door would open. They'd pass through. It would shut. They'd be gone. The difference was place, yes, yes, but more but so also. time. It's maze, subtractive, additive. How does it, this invisible branching river, sweep away our children and return new ones daily to its banks, shaped and filled more themselves than who they always were? Oh, wonderful. Um, next is Nicholas Rodriguez from Patterson, New Jersey. Nicholas, I know I saw you. All right, there yes. you are. Yes, hi, Maria. Thanks, Maria, for all you do. And thanks, uh, Smita and uh, Susan, Susan and the poets. Thank you. Uh, this is Overnight. I remember the weight of you sleeping next to me your breath waking me in winter, your nightmare spasms, the twist and tangle of sheets, our tug of war with blankets, you cold-blooded, hated layers while I drowned in flannel and never felt warm enough. I remember I traced the outline of your face, smoothed your eyebrows and sharp features with curious fingers under the covers. You cupped the small of my neck, the bliss of our playfulness when you joined me in the shower. 
I remember the last night we said I love you in bed. It was late autumn, the silent nights that followed. You tried strategizing, manipulating where the dog would sleep overnight. But he always ended nestled into my chest by morning. Both of our backs turned to you. I can't wait to be as far away from you as possible. You uttered in bed the night we put our apartment on the market. Why wait, I retorted, grabbing my pillow as I headed to the couch. It's been 10 years since our breakup. What I remember most is spending six months sleeping on our black velour camelback sofa, the hump couch, I called it, remarking on its shape, not our physical activity. I relocated to the Bronx a month before we sold our apartment. I managed boxes in the rain, one arm hoisting up the broken station wagon, hatchback door, the other hand balancing an umbrella, feet, knees, limbs, juggling, struggling to make sense of my departure. Our neighbor's son offered help. You stayed inside. Come lay beside me was your request on 13th Street. You were on your back. It was your last request. You were on the floor, sobbing in the middle of an empty room, lying on our full-size mattress, which had been stripped bare. I'm fine where I am, I argued. I wasn't. We lost faith in each other. We had been unfaithful. We were undone. Wonderful, Nicholas. Very honest poem. Um, C.J. Southworth, uh, from Watertown, New York. Now, I do see you. So, CJ, I'm not sure you're there or not. Are you? Maybe not. He was drowning in Zoom classes and papers. Um, Claire Scott from Oakland, California. Claire Scott? No. Emily Style. I know I saw you. Emily, where are you? There she is. Aren't words and voices something um, something wonderful? I'm glad to be here. I'll, I'll always thankful to you, Maria. My poem, you, how can it be at 70 that I am wearing my father's wedding ring? How this came to be involves my sibs and me and the beloved engagement photo of our mother that our father kept in a simple three by five frame on his dresser all the days since our mom died 19 years ago. When dad died at 94, the funeral home inquired about his missing wedding ring, but it was not to be found. The day after his funeral in his room, we took turns, oldest to youngest, claiming treasures to take home. My first pick as the oldest was dad's beloved dresser photo of mom, his Emily. After many go rounds, much had been dispersed. So brother Johnny was on the floor seeking whatever, if anything, under dad's bed when he lifted up dad's quilt. Lo and behold, Lodged between the mattress and the black metal bed frame was dad's plain gold wedding ring. As it happened, brother Bill's turn was next and he picked the ring. Time passed that Saturday afternoon as we worked together to put to rest dad's earthly belongings. It was almost time to shut the door to the now empty room when brother Len, affectionately known as number seven, the youngest of us all, tapped me on the elbow and whispered, I'm here to make a trade. On behalf of brother Bill, who really wants the treasured photo of mom that dad kept on his dresser. Would you trade it for dad's wedding ring? I said, yes. As I placed the ring on my aging finger, belonging anew to mom and dad, whose union tenderly fingered my own coming 70 years ago 
into the ring of being, to be further blessed by six sibs, to belong to two. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, Emily, beautiful. Now, I know, I don't know whether Eric Paul Schaffner from Kalua, Hawaii is here. I didn't even know what time it would be in Hawaii. So I'm a little doubtful that he would be here. I saw John Sinisi and from Coventry, Connecticut. So, so John, your turn is next. Where are you, honey? I now lost you, of course. John? You're muted, John. Where is he? Okay, I'm right here. Okay, you, you're muted, so unmute yourself. Oh, you did unmute yourself. I think I did, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thanks so much to, uh, to Maria and blessings to Laura. Um, the poem I'm gonna read is a garland. Uh, two new leaves ago, my best friend's boy was coming home uh, on leave uh, from the Navy when we lost him in a horrible car crash. Uh, this is called The Fallen Leaves. And it begins with an epigraph from Amy Clampett called Fog. Amy says, the nodding campanula of bellboys, the ticking linear filigree of bird voices, the fallen leaves. Others remain after the fallen leaves. And then it's all fog. Everything is fog. And of course, the idea that you are safe is more unreal than that thing you cannot grasp no matter how many decades pass. Would it help to capture fog in a net, harnessed Kemenchaka, creeping fog, that Chilean fog catchers trap and drink. Would that help? That half science, half magic? Or is there nothing that will help you heal? There is something comforting when the light is yellow, billowing despondency that you imagine would glow in a glass, an aura around the brokenhearted whose faces you don't need to see to know. The banging halyard in concert with the companiona of bellboys, the language in the mist, always urgent, always taught, even with good news, the voices are tense. When you have nothing left to say, what then? After the crash, after your boy was killed, you became a shattered pane of stained glass. Sleeplessly unconscious, your words came like shards of January light breaking you. The fragments need shoring, the heart comfort. Others remain after the fallen leaves, harnessing Kamenchaka the creeping fog that you imagine would glow in the glass. Even with good news, the voices are tense. The fragments need shoring the heart comfort. Thank you very much. Wonderful, John. Uh, our next person, I don't see, but maybe she's here. Lynn Solignet from Medford, New York. Mm -hmm. Here? No. Okay, Margaret Serrano, Serrano. Hey. Can Why? you hear me? Who is that? Um, I'm, I'm calling for Lynn. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes. I okay, can. Uh, her come, she has a Kindle and she couldn't get through to the Zoom. I'm her friend, Gloria Murray. So she would like me to read the poem for her. Is that okay? And yes, that's fine. Oh, good. I'm glad. I didn't know how to unmute it, so I got nervous. And uh, <laughs> she, she, she's on the phone. I don't know if you could hear her if she reads it. I, I don't know, honey. I'm not technological. All right, all right. Let me let me just read the poem. Just read it and let's go because we have a lot of people. Here. Okay, I'm sorry. Barriers. 
My son barely says a word to me. Sullen and silent, he broods over long forgotten trivia. Slights clings to them, clings to them like barnacles or, or on the bow of an ancient ship. His wife, his mother-in-law lay claim to another country. Consider me a foreigner in my own. They like to talk politics, argue, get under my pacifist skin. I've learned to keep my counsel even when visits are canceled and gatherings are reserved for their side of the family. My grandson expects me, can, ex expects me, cannot understand my absence when I'm allowed to see him. He offers toys, games, carnivals, trying to entice me to come on weekends or any day in between. He does not see the walls they've erected to keep me outside, away from him. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Sad, but wonderful. Uh, Margaret Sirocco. I'm here. Montfort, New Jersey. I know yeah, you're there. I, I saw you started. before. I'm right I'm here, Maria. Hi, Maria. Lovely Hi, to be honey. here. Oh. Collectible. Unmute this now. Uh, the 1950s Art Deco style chrome plated kitchen table with a set of four vinyl covered chairs sells on eBay for over $900. Reminds me of my aunt's kitchen set. She could have used the money. While it looks like her wait, table. Wait, wait, wait. Somebody's not muted and a phone is ringing. Okay. Do you want me to start Mute yourself, on? whoever that is. Hang on. Okay. Do you want me to start over? Yes, because okay, it was sure. disturbing. Okay. All right. Uh, collectible. The 1950s Art Deco style chrome plated kitchen table with a set of four vinyl covered chairs sells on eBay for over $900. Reminds me of my aunt's kitchen set. She could have used the money. While it looks like her table, this set is missing nicks on the legs, the dogs made when they wanted scraps, a knife slice on the right corner when someone forgot to use a cutting board, the yellow brown cigarette stain my grandfather made and never scrubbed away, the broken vinyl on the chairs from overuse, pieces of cottony tufts protruding resealed with <laughs> duct tape that scratched our legs. It was also missing my aunts, my mother, my cousins, my sister, my father, my grandparents, my uncle, the after school coffee time, the drama, the ordinary the lived in, and me seated with them. Oh, I love it. Thank Mark. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, next is Matthew Spearing, Kingston, New York. I know I saw him before. Here. Okay, Matthew. Okay. Read your poem, honey. I, I can't quite find you, but I know you're there and I'll hear your voice. Here I am. Did you find me yet? I, I fear not, but I'm a little dippy. <laughs> I'm waving. <laughs> oh, I see you. All right, good. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, tell me. No, now, now. Go ahead. Okay. This is called Quick Pick It Up. That's in quotes. 60 years later, I still remember my mother's words in the five and dime store when I spotted a $5 bill on the floor in an aisle next to a counter gloves maybe, or, or woolen hats for sale, and told her, and she responded, almost frantically it seemed, quick, pick it up, and I did, and handed it to her, and she slipped it into her purse, so it seemed as if it never existed there on the floor of the store. <laughs> but when the Marbletown Elementary School PTA, of which my mother was a member, taped kindergartners telling stories for the delight of all, I told about shopping with my mother and spotting the $5 bill and my mother saying, quick, pick it up. I even tried to put her urgency in my voice for all her friends to hear, which they <laughs> did. And everyone at the meeting when the tape was played laughed, even though nervously, my mother, who I eventually realized probably was thinking, quick, turn it off, and wishing she could disappear as fast as the bill in her purse. Wonderful, Matthew. 
Uh, she must have wanted to kill you. Um, next is Michael uh, Salkman, uh, Baltimore, Net Maryland. And I hope I present and pronounced your name correctly. Uh, it, it was pretty good, Saltzman. Maria, thank you for everything you do for poetry. Oh, Great you're pleasure being here. Thank uh, you, dear. The poem is called His Tongue. My grandson yells because he cannot hear. Slowly, he's learning words part by part. His father repeats over and over, each plosive like a block thrown at a wall. He grabs at his super ears, first pulling them off, then putting them on when the world disappears. Hungry for words, he looks into the digital camera and smiling says something a lot like Bubby or Grampy or any other word welding us together. We strain to understand what he means. Is it love or frustration mixed with peanut butter beneath his tongue? marinating meaning on the mouth's grill. He builds highways with his older brother, dances ballet with his sister, makes some think it's not the ear but the brain. I hope that isn't true. I've been there with scalpels and suckers and electrodes for years. The brain's beyond calculation the ear just a bell in a symphony. I touch my lips to the screen as if working the levers of eternity. Tell everyone not to worry. Wonderful, beautiful poem. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, Paul Sohar from Warren, New Jersey. I know I saw Paul before, so I know he's here somewhere. Paul Sohar. Yeah, Paul, unmute yourself. Paul, unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Read your poem. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, my poem, um, The Endless End. It's dedicated to the memory of my daughter who passed away not long ago. She was already 50 years old, but uh, still my little girl. Hmm. When she turned 18, I set her free. Let her leave the family garden and tend to her own flower bed, just as I stayed in the old one, minding the same old herbs. She was more than eager to make the leap and fence off her own flower bed. But instead of drawing flowers, she drew pictures of them, one on top of another with a finger in the dirt. But stormy winds and showers washed away her creations, erasing the flowers drawn in soil until after years of work, her flower bed turned fallow like a desert. Even its outlines were hard to frame. Now she shares the flower bed with the whole big family, granddad and grandmother and more, all of them working together to grow, grand, grow granite slabs that no wind can sweep away. No seasons can age. Mm, wonderful. Um, next is R Richard Silberg from Berkeley, California, but I don't know if I saw him. Richard, are you there? Okay, if not, then Leah Umansky from New York. I didn't see her either. Leah? Okay. I'm Andrew Vinstra from Highland Park, Michigan? No. Okay. Eileen Van Cook, a hook, I know I saw you, from Wanaku, New Jersey. Eileen Van Hook. I saw you before, Eileen, unless you vanished. Eileen, 
Eileen Van Hook. I know I saw her five seconds ago. Well, perhaps she went to the bell. No, here she is. Eileen, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Eileen. You, Eileen. She's unmuted, Maria. Oh, she is? Okay, read your poem, Eileen. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, Maria. Sunburn. When I was a child, there were hats or shade to protect skin from the sun's rays. It was considered healthy to glow with a slight burn, or if you were lucky, a tan. Some of my friends applied baby oil and simmered in the heat. Not me. I just watched the freckles spread on my burning skin, certain I was looking good. The day of my senior prom, I decided my skin was too pale for the pink strapless gown I planned to wear. It seemed that I always got more color when I went down the shore. So I did the obvious thing, made up a large batch of salt water, basted my body and laid out to broil. It worked. <laughs> the soft pink gown was a stunning contrast against my lobster red skin. <laughs> After a couple of bouts of sun poisoning the following years, I finally realized that I had to protect my skin from the sun. So before renting a motorbike, my first day in Bermuda, I dressed accordingly, long sleeve shirt, long pants, even a headscarf. You guessed it, sun poisoning on my hands. I took my ballooning hands to the doctor where I was treated and told to stay out of the sun in Bermuda. Over the past 20 years, I have paid for un underestimating the sun's strength with more than a dozen skin cancers. I long to lift my face to the light, but like so many things I want, the price is just too high. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful, Eileen. Beautiful poem. Um, okay, Rick from Ridgefield Park, New Jersey. Rick, I know I see you. Yes, I'm here. Um, I don't think I can see myself, but uh, that's okay. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for this journal, um, my thank hometown you. journal, by the way. I'm originally from Patterson, New Jersey. Um, at the corner of Sheridan and McClellan. The successful poem says enough to have her and her husband deported. The block is under reconstruction and I say to Milagros, I will make the phone call to turn the wheels, to turn paper into kept promises for her three citizen children. I am the caseworker. I must find the proper pronunciation for misdiagnosis. Last week, her husband received a letter telling him to watch the sky for the Hornet Squadron. A lawyer working for free tells me ICE has the wrong Jimenez. They call off the guns for now. The nation is at war with itself. She says in Spanish, soy alérgica a la morfina. In Spanish, the nurse responds, no te preocupes. After the injection, Milagros drops to the tile and someone we will never know who. Slips a new entry onto the chart. No morphine. The social worker looks up from her sandwich to explain in English that undocumented persons have more chances at Lincoln Hospital. That Milagros is entitled to one high impact intervention, which means I think we can save your life, senora, but don't expect us to prolong it. On a tiny paper square, I write two questions in English. Why was the morphine sensitivity noted so late. Can morphine cause acute gastritis? For clarity, I copy the questions into Spanish. The doctor politely declines pen and paper, will not accept the form that allows an advocate to peer past the guard shack of medical practice. At discharge, she receives diagnoses, doctors, prescriptions, and grievance procedures in English and Spanish. No mention of morphine, morphina. No mention of her failing liver. She dreamed it all, maybe. Her migrant pains. The Army of the Potomac, 
sharpening its iron. The army of the Shenandoah, blooming fire across the valley. In his diaries, McClellan calls dysentery his Mexican disease. Girded for battle, building bridges for Winfield Scott in Pueblo south of the Rio Grande. Sheridan at the Columbia River executes Yakima and Cascade alike, treaty signed to overrule the rush of water and breath. And Lincoln, chain breaker, allied white man, freedom bringer and friend to all colors of the Americas, summons the two great generals to burn everything that is left. En la esquina de Cheridan y Maclellan se encuentra mi edificio, señor Rich, Verás al entrar la puerta cuántos apartamentos el súper se tuvo que cerrar por violaciones. Este landlord nos quiere votar y aquí no arregla ni cojones, perdón, Milagro says. Por las malas palabras, pero es que ya no queda otra manera de decírselo. And with this, I write down vital statistics to return with speed to nonprofit funders who interject during meetings with questions like, there's nothing you wouldn't do for a client, is there? as though the country hasn't already swung the wrecking ball, hasn't already called you accomplice, hasn't already declared war, hasn't already marched across the Bronx River to meet the enemies of the nation and call them milagros. Thank you. Mm, wonderful, Rick. Okay, let me see. Um, Yvonne Vinstra from Highland, Highland Park, Michigan. Did I see Yvonne? I'm not sure. Yvonne, are you there? No, all right. Connemara Wadsworth, Newton, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and I did see her before. Not that I know her, but I, I did see her. Because I love the name. Connemara. Okay. Wonderful. I'm Who here. are you, honey? Right here. Right here. Too bad I can't find you. Well, I'm next to you on my screen. Oh, here, I got you. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. This is after my fourth or fifth move as a child. Mrs. Appleton, my sixth school, British accent gone. My teacher seats me where I can see her. When I am lost, she helps me. The year before the class mastered cursive, I still print. My letter M looks like N on my spelling test. Mrs. Appleton pairs me with kind girls, gives me second chances. I like kickball, run better than I kick. Still, I don't have crinolines, sweater sets or saddle shoes. Who am I, this girl caught between worlds? Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful, honey. I love your name too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, wait a minute. Elizabeth Weiss from Marblehead, Massachusetts. Is she here? Yes, I am. And I'm going to read On the Geriatric Floor. Okay. All right. Um, when Sully touched down, he must have kissed his St. Christopher's, climbed onto a wing to assist. My father was napping in his hospital room. I needed to tell him my mother died. We watched the news together. Without engine thrust, the plane descended rapidly. The nose came up, the wings perfectly level at impact so the plane wouldn't cartwheel and break into pieces. We could feel and hear the thumps and thuds as we struck the birds, followed by a shuddering. Clear day, sun and cold, ice on the water. A woman down the hall said she couldn't remember her own name, but she knew she was seeing a miracle when Sully swooped through the envelope of blue. The indifferent wind kicked up. Exhausted, I clicked a Kodak carousel, projected family slides on the wall above his bed. I slept on a chair, used my coat as a blanket, and listened to him breathe like a torn up bag 
inside out, fluttering. Later, my father said, I only remember the good parts. Mm. Thank you. That's a blessing to only remember the good parts. I agree. Uh, Thank you so much, Maria. John, now I'm going to mispronounce your name, John. John Wachowick, I don't know, Bridgeton, New Jersey. John, W-O-J-T-O-W-I-C-C. Are you there? Well, maybe it's a good thing you're not because I butchered your name. Uh, Martin Willits, Jr. Uh, from Syracuse, New York. I thought I saw you before. Martin. I'm here. Okay, good. Read your poem. Uh, thank you for this program. My poem is called On My Grandparents' Mennonite Farm. The taskmaster's son reminded me, hard work is next to godliness. I start up the roosters, singing cowbells to open the sun's eyes. I switch on the moon at night. I work between working Ciphering the amount of seed into furrow land, I hand plowed into submission. No time to contemplate what failure might be. Only where to place my hands to smooth the mare struggling to deliver a foal. Sometimes grandpa would forget lunch Grandma would bring a wicker basket of homemade bread, still fresh from the black pot-bellied stove. I smell the flour and butter years after they died. The farm was sold. I couldn't find where it used to be after they portioned the area into closed knit housing. Some places are just plain lost to us when we get older. Thank you. So true. Um, next is Valerie Drack Weidmeren from Hiding, Hiding Park, New Jersey. Sorry, I'm tri- tripping over my own tongue. Valerie, I'm sure I saw you before. Have you given up? Okay. Uh, Zant Wintress, Zant, I saw you. Hi, Maria. Too. I know you're there. Okay, good. Uh, okay, would you read the poem? Okay, I'm ready, sure. <clears throat> this is Girlfriend. Cherry kept calling her my girlfriend. Why was your girlfriend yelling at you like that? I explained that she was not my girlfriend though no explanation was really necessary. She knew that girlfriend or my girlfriend or whatever or whoever was not actually my girlfriend. And besides, she wasn't yelling. At least I didn't think she was yelling. Well, she was yelling, Cherry insisted, and it was hurting my ears. Well, I hadn't noticed, I told her while taking a deep breath. Well, how could you not have noticed? She further insisted as she further queried. Okay then, Cherry amended. Why was she barking at you like that? I didn't know if barking was an upgrade or a downgrade. What did I know from yelling? And I didn't care. It didn't matter. Girlfriend could have if she'd wanted, got all up in my face if she'd wanted. I was not going to yell back. I would have remained in a state of whatever state it was I was in at that point as I was attempting to be charming while not being obsequious. (laughs) I smiled and nodded and did everything short of batting my eyes at the woman. It was a fine line I'd just ridden, ridden it with an applaudable aplomb. Cherry seemed to have no appreciation for the adroitness and skill with which I just handled myself. And so I guess she was yelling, I finally agreed, because behind her, 
four lanes of traffic were whizzing by at the 55 miles per hour girlfriend had insisted I'd not been going. Girlfriend had not given me a ticket. And that's all that mattered. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Let's see here. Okay. Now, I see some people that I called before, but that I missed. So one of the people is Elizabeth Marchetti. Uh, and is she here now? Yeah, all right, Elizabeth. Turn your sound on. Sound. What's the matter? I can't hear you. Can you tell what she's saying, anybody? Maria, she, she has to unmute it. I'm asking her, but. I, I she seems know. to be trying to tell us something, but I don't know what it yeah, is. Yeah, but we, oh, now it's okay. Okay, she, Elizabeth. She, Unmute yourself, darling. Okay, good. Now you're unmuted. Read your poem. You can't hear her. Elizabeth, you're, read your poem. No, no. No, you're not unmuted. It says she's unmuted, but she's not. I don't hear her. She's trying to tell me something, tell us something, but I have no idea what she's yeah, saying. Yeah, but her microphone is not working. Yeah, looks like. Oh, is your microphone not working? Okay, well, another time, darling. Okay, whoever, who else did I miss? Did I miss somebody else? Um, yeah, I think Danny Romero. Okay, Danny. Um, I thought you yes. had a short story, but you can't read no. the whole short story. No, I just yeah, had a poem, uh, as a matter of fact, right? Uh, thank you, for Maria, for, for the journal, and thank you for the whole hosting this event. You know, I was an hour late uh, because I'm in California, and I can't count. I can't so count. Here's the poem. I understand the feeling, Danny. Okay. Okay, it's Danny's called... from Sacramento, California. Good to yes. see you, Danny. I haven't thank seen you. you in 20 years, I think. I think it's been more like 30 years. 30 years, maybe. Well, something you know, like I, that, right? I, so that's called Just to Reach Away. My okay. mother asks for candy more than once when she sees me, as if I should carry it with me, a Jolly Rancher or Lollipop or Lemon Heads at the very least, just to reach away. We worked together in the 1970s, a long haired teenage boy leaving home for college. She carried ginger candy, but I enjoyed it all the same walking home some days. Today she lies on a bed in the corner of my sister's small duplex, not too far from her own home, except there's no going back. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Dan, thank you. Thank you. Anybody you. else that I missed? Anyone else that I missed? Well, let's give everybody a round of applause. That was a wonderful reading. And I'm sorry we can't all be together, but the advantage of this is that people from very far away can join us. So it's a very nice thing that people from very far away can be with us. Whereas sometimes when we have these readings at the Poetry Center, only people from three or four states can be with us. So this is good because of that. Uh, this will also be live streamed after. And I, I thank you for being part of PLR. And uh, please buy extra copies and give them away to your friends. And um, uh, there's the cover of the magazine, which has on it Mark Killinghouse's photograph of the Poetry Center building, the Hamilton building. Anyway, uh, one, have a wonderful rest of the Saturday. And uh, keep writing. Keep sending out work uh, and yeah. see you all soon. Hopefully in person. All right. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Bye, Maria. Maria. Thanks, Mita. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you, Maria. Thanks, 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 thanks for all the poets. Oh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for putting this together. Bye. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Well, let's well. thanks Mita and, and thank Sue you. also. Because uh, without their technical ability, we wouldn't be able to do this and their organizational <laughs> ability. So between Smita and Sue, 
They're invaluable. Thank you, girls. Bye. Ladies. Thank, Thank you, Smita. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Have a wonderful, wonderful Saturday, the rest of your Saturday. You too. All right. You, Maria. you too, Maria. We love you. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, Maria. Love you. Bye, honey. Bye-bye. <laughs> You're lucky I'm not calling you Dolly, which the old ladies in my neighborhood used to call us Dolly. Oh. I don't know what exactly <laughs> what. I didn't look particularly like a Dolly, unless you had a Dolly from Italy who looked very far. Oh, well. <laughs> that was the Dolly I was. Just, just feel like I'm at a nice truck stop, you know? Coffee hunt? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll see you. Bye, doll. All right. <laughs> okay. Bye, Lisa. Bye, Maria. It was a wonderful afternoon. It was fun, wasn't it? It's always fun to hear the poems.